ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Hey, Paula. Hey, Killian. How's your week been? Really great. Do you want to hear the next part of what Professor Will had to say? Yes, let's go. All right, let's do it. I think you touched on this uh, a little before earlier, uh, the topic of uh, the transportation and delivery. Um, I feel like probably 10 years ago or something, you had all these huge companies promising that the next thing was uh, you're going to get everything delivered by your drone. Um, so I'm just briefly, or, 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 or the main points of... Why, why, why am I not getting my, my package by, or rather my pizza yes. by, a, by, by drone? Yeah. Technologies in general evolve somehow in hypes, right? And uh, when we was basically like the first generation of quad orders out there, then of course lots of companies jumped on this idea of delivering items with your drone. And of course, this is very tentative. Why is this tentative? So basically, if you think about that you get your food order delivered by a drone, it has lots of advantages, right? As well, like from a societal point of view. So you do not get your pizza delivered by a car driver that pollutes the air. Um, you have not well-paid uh, laborers included. So you're the poor guy who has to deliver the food is usually not well-paid, maybe even not health insured, something like that. So this idea of getting your order delivered by a drone is very tentative because you just order it. It is cool because it includes lots of cool technology. And as well, it is, let's say, like from a economic or ecological point of view, it might be more energy efficient than using, for example, a car. Um, why did it not work? So this is as well a very good question. So in principle, if I would ask my PhD students to take a drone and deliver something from here in Otterbrunn to the main campus, they would be able to do that and solve the task in a couple of days. But doing that once is the easy thing, right? So um, the problem appears if you have to understand all the edge cases, what can go wrong. So first of all, you have to understand how can I make that really reliably working? How can I make it working without GPS? How can I make it working under different weather conditions? It might be rainy. It might be that there is snow on the streets and all this changes a lot of parameters, but as well, in mainly as well, the perception pipeline. So you have to make it robust to lots of unforeseen events. And making that is very hard. And then, of course, there is this other side, um, which is more like from an organizational point of view. This delivery service is a bit challenging in the sense of liability. Right? So um, in order to make a delivery service feasible, you have to deliver the thing or the, the food, the pizza, to a certain location. But how do you define this location? Is this the entry of the building? Is this a safe spot to land? Or can you land always in someone else's backyard, but that as well already reduces the significantly the amount of customers? And in the end, what you really do not want to have is a drone landing somewhere where no one is observing the drone, um, close to whatever, people, kids, pets that are maybe just running around in the backyard and injure somebody. So these are the reasons why just like the common way to just deliver something is with landing a drone is not a f possible option just all out of liability reasons. So therefore, of course, there was a solution found. So basically the most common or the most practiced way or a most common idea to solve this problem would be to just like uh, rope something or belay something down from a flying system. But that as well has their own challenges. So in the end, the resulting factor was that it's more expensive and more challenging than it was imagined to be in the beginning. Um, but we see lots of edge cases and we see again more companies jumping on that train. Um, so for example, as soon as you need to transport something that is expensive, where it's reasonable to have like an emergency pilot that can as well take over the control of the drone. Uh, but to be useful in that case, the good that is transported needs to be expensive or at least need to be there in a very short amount of time. And then it becomes certainly a business case. So perhaps like medical cases where, exactly. where exactly. you're trying to get something exactly. from. Exactly. So one of the cases uh, is perhaps you're familiar with Zipline. Yes, exactly. Do you, do you feel like example. that example is something that we can also perhaps see 
um, not only in, in remote areas, but also in, uh, let's say, in, in uh, big uh, urban areas. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe just for the listeners here that are not familiar with Zipline. So Zipline is a company that transports goods and it's mainly active in the field of medical transportation, so transport of medical goods. Um, and what they're using, the platform they're using is not a quadrotor platform or a multirotor platform, but they use a fixed wing system. Um, to transport goods and the most, I, I think the latest uh, system changed a little bit, but let's say like the selling point and their most common business model is that they parachute the delivery close to the field where they want to deliver it to. Um, but again, there the business model is a little bit different. So they have like a central hub where they store the medical goods and then they transport these goods to, for example, remote located hospitals. But on this remote site, there's usually some predefined ground where the vehicle is allowed to parachute the transported good down. So, and as well at the ground, there's someone waiting for the drone. So that makes easily a business model out of it. So there's someone waiting for the system. And that's as well, like from a control perspective and from a roboticist perspective, an easy to solve task. So because they basically, they just rely on GPS navigation. They fly high enough to be not close to obstacles. And then they just like drop the parcel where it's located and they fly back to their home location. And so then, so perhaps that's something that could be urbanized, but um, you're, you also mentioned before that perhaps, uh, let's say Amazon and these other mass delivery companies, would, do you think they were just ahead of their time? And is there at some point in the future where we're really going to have most things del delivered by drones? Or is it rather just that some mm -hmm. small exceptions, like you were saying that yes. expensive goods probably make more mm -hmm. sense, but is, you know, do you see a timeline where at some point I'm just getting yes. stuff delivered by drone? So that is a challenging question because um, it's a bit hard to foresee the future as always, right? Um, so if I would have to give my two cents on that, I would say like in the near future, we will not see mass transportation with small scale drones, but that's just the near future. Um, we'll have to see how technology evolves, how machine learning evolves. Um, this is, well, the question that you were asking is very closely linked, for example, to autonomous driving, right? So we as well had this hype on autonomous driving like uh, almost 10 years ago, where as well all companies promised that we'll have fully autonomous cars in a very near future. And it turned out to be a harder problem than expected. And the problem that we're solving with autonomous drones is exactly the same problem, right? So we have to as well completely autonomously navigate an environment that we um, only partially know. So we, for example, could in principle rely on maps that exist. But of course, this we have to be robust enough to deal with changes in this environment. And of course, we have as well a dy dynamic environment. So we as well, we have people walking around, we have trees that are moving in the wind. So that makes it usually as well a dynamic environment. And where we have to as well always do our planning and flying based on our local observations. And to do that safely, Right, you have to exactly solve the same problem that people have to solve for autonomous driving, only with a small difference that we're moving at 3D. Right, so in principle, this is you could consider this as an even harder problem, but with very limited hardware on board. Right, so an autonomous car has usually a very large computer on board or multiple computers, including multiple CPUs, multiple GPUs to process all this information. But on a drone, we are really forced, at least on the smaller scale drones, to just like have a very limited or edge devices that are limited in their computational power. And that makes the problem even harder. So that's why I'm a bit hesitating to say that we're having in the near future lots of autonomous vehicles flying around. Obviously, you need some sensors to pick up the data. What type of sensors would you use in a drone? Um, so we can maybe list all the sensors that exist and discuss the pros and cons. So first of all, of course, on board to fly a platform, you need an IMU. So an IMU usually includes a gyroscope right, or three gyroscopes for every rotational axis, one gyroscope that gives you something or some information about the rotational velocity and you're having accelerometers on board and sometimes even um, a magnetometer, right? So this is just like the minimum baseline that you have to have to even like for a drone that is not flying autonomously, but um, controlled by a human pilot to stabilize the drone. Because otherwise it's just an unstable device. Um, so this is the minimum set. But then on top of that, 
what is usually used first of all you're having as well often if you are allowed or if you if you fly outdoors you have a gps antenna and that gives you already a good tracking of the environment um, but if you want to fly really autonomously, that is not sufficient because uh, the reason is simple. So, for example, in very cloudy situations or if you want to transit from indoor to outdoor or from outdoor to indoor, your GPS navigation will fail. Or if you're, for example, even flying for this is the scenario of, for example, looking for a lost hiker in a forest environment, flying under a tree canopy as well as well significantly reduces the, uh, the accuracy of GPS. So therefore, you have to have other sensors on board. And the main use sensors there are either cameras or a LiDAR, so a, la a laser rangefinder. Um, so basically, they both have their pros and cons. There are very different sensors. Let's maybe start with a LiDAR. So LiDAR emits some kind of a laser, and it basically either measures the time of flight um, or uses other methods to understand the depth to a certain point. The great benefit of a LiDAR is that you get precise information of the depth around you but it has as well drawbacks. So first of all, certain objects can't be seen. So for everything that is reflective, can't be seen. So for example, metallic surfaces are hard to perceive, but as well, for example, water is hard to perceive. Um, and compared to a camera, a LiDAR has a very uh, low resolution. So because you have to do a, like a measurement for every single point, you have to direct your LiDAR to get the measurement there, and as well the time resolution is significantly lower than for a camera. And if we think about cameras, right, cameras have really the benefit, they're extremely cheap, right? So we have cameras everywhere nowadays. We have every smartphone has multiple cameras, so usually the top-notch smartphones have four to five cameras integrated, right? So you have like three on the back, two on the front. Um, then we have like cameras everywhere, and they're incredibly cheap, and they're very interesting and incredible sensors. Why is this the case? Um, Normally, cameras nowadays offer an HD resolution, right? So that already includes lots of pixels. But as well, we don't only measure one value, but with every pixel, we as well have the information of the color. So we have an RGBD, or uh, sorry, an RGB image there. And additionally, we have like the, um, the spectrum of light. So how much, how strong is the signal? So this includes a lot of information. So if you would just like include that, like in a raw image, you would in a few seconds generate gigabytes of data. And while this is at one side great, right, it is as well challenges your perception algorithm because you have to somehow process this data and that is very challenging. And maybe one last benefit of cameras is that humans have eyes as well. So why is this a benefit? We generated or m created our world, right, that it's a very visual world. So lots of things that we put in our environment are visual cues to how to behave. And these cues can as well be leveraged with using a camera. So if you think about street signs and so on, right, these are all visual cues that tell us something about the environment. And we use this science to navigate around. And if we use the camera on board of a drone, we can as well leverage this additional cues for navigation as well. You also mentioned that obviously when we get the data, when we get the visual aspect, we need to somehow turn it into a model or something the drone can work with and use to kind of plan its path, yeah. if you say it like that. Um, what kind of systems are there for that? So um, let's maybe talk about how you build up an autonomy stack. So we can just maybe touch this topic because it's a very interesting and very um, exciting topic. So the most common way is first you use your sensor data to build somehow a representation of your world. So the basic steps are, first of all, you need to build this environment or this scene that you're currently seeing, right? And this is usually also well often included in an algorithm that is called SLAM. So simultaneous localization and mapping. That is a very, very common problem in robotics. That means basically when you consider the problem of a kidnapped robot, right? Uh, you don't know where your robot starts. It has to, at the same time, build a representation of the environment and additionally localize itself in this environment. And that is a bit of a chicken egg problem. And, but this is a problem that is well researched. So the SLAM algorithms go back to the 70s. 
um, when they were first developed, but it's still a very active field of research. So SLAM is not something that you could consider as solved because there are always edge cases that are hard to understand and hard to use. Um, but again, the, the first step is just like using your sensors, fuse them to a representation of your environment and try to localize yourself in this environment. And then usually the common task that you want to do next is to build a path to the plan or the place where you want to go. And based on this path, then you compute a trajectory, how to get there. So the difference between path and trajectory is that the trajectory includes the time. So you know when you're going to do, be there. And the last step is then close the loop with the controller. OK, so you already mentioned kind of the process we need to bring the data into a form we can use for a path. Um, and you published a paper this year um, that focuses on a real-time neural model predictive control framework. Perfectly said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, which is a combination of a neural network and an MPC. First of all, what even is a neural network? Um, so neural networks is um, a control or a compute algorithm. Let's phrase it like that. that uh, or neural networks in general is a very broad topic of research. Um, in its simplest form, let's phrase it like that, we have different layers in a neural network that are linked with different functions. So we can have as well different functions, right, that uh, connect these different layers to each other. And what you can change on the neural networks are certain parameters. So basically, you can tune the connection between these layers. And we started with neural networks with fully connected layers, like a uh, long while ago, where basically every node in a feed forward was connected to the next node. Um, and these weights between those nodes defined in the end the output that you can see on the output of your neural network. So, and the tricky or the challenging part is, or the exciting part about it is that you can train your neural network. So you initially start with a neural network where all these parameters or these gains have some kind of a random initialization. But then you use a technique that's called backwards propagation to change these gains slightly with respect to some kind of a reward function. And that brings the neural networks towards some kind of an optimization where you can achieve some output that you desire. So you use, use some, for example, pre-labeled data. So the classical thing is you want to label in an image, is there a giraffe or a zebra or a turtle? And you reward in the spec propagation whether the neural network correctly um, understood what is a zebra and what is a giraffe. Um, and with this baseline technology, we build up neural networks today. There are nowadays much more advanced models as well have like some back propagation or so some feedback loops. Um, we're having significantly more complex neural networks as well include, for example, time series of data. Um, and based on that, we achieve nowadays really amazing things with neural networks. Okay, and the other aspect is the model predictive control. Mm -hmm. How does that come into play? Okay, so model predictive control is as well a well-established technology that we're using nowadays. Um, it is basically we take the current state of our system, right? So, for example, if we take our quadrotor, we know what is the current state, and we assume we want to, for example, track a d um, desired trajectory with it. So we know at certain sampling times what should be the state of the platform in these certain locations, and in model predictive control, what we're doing is we have some kind of a horizon in which we use a model of our quadrotor to estimate, or in like some kind of a rollout step to estimate what happens when we do certain control inputs. And then we can, for example, use a quadratic optimizer to minimize the error, so where we best track this trajectory in a certain horizon. And this is called model predictive control. So you mentioned the paper that we've been working on, and um, what we're doing there is combining machine learning and or a deep neural network together with model predictive control. Um, why is this helpful? So especially in what we're doing is real-time model predictive control, right? We have to rely on very simple models of our system. Why is this the case? Because we want to, at every control step, do this rollout, this forward rollout, to model the behavior of our drone. But if we use or in order to do that, we have to rely on very simple models of a quadrotor. So that is excluding all the aerodynamic effects that we're having, because otherwise we can't do the model predictive control in real time. We use this real-time capability. 
Um, having said that, actually, to be honest, modeling the aerodynamics, as we discussed before, is very, very hard. So it's a, a not understood problem. Or um, let's phrase it even differently. We would have to know the full state of the environment to do some kind of uh, reasoning about the aerodynamic behavior. But we don't know the airflow at every single time step. So doing that is hard or almost impossible with the techniques that we're having right now. Um, flying without a neural network is something that we can do very well, right? But as soon as we fly very dynamically, so or let's rephrase it very aggressively, extreme accelerations, or if you, for example, end up with our propellers in the own, uh, own downwash of the propeller, we're having aerodynamic effects that uh, suddenly start to matter significantly. So we have really, for example, the thrust that we generate with a single propeller that is in its moving through its own, own downwash changes drastically. So as soon as we really fly very aggressively and very dynamically, we have to use other methods to still control the platform sufficiently good. And what we've done in this approach is we combined the strength of um, neural networks together with MPC. So we model the standard easy model in model predictive control, but we know that there is some part of the aerodynamics that is not captured by the simple model. And we learn this residual over time. So we, for example, flew a trajectory just like a circle trajectory or an H-shaped trajectory with a high velocity, so really fast. So that means we're really accelerating extreme in this kind of cases. And there is some residual if we fly just with a nominal controller that is not captured by the standard model. But as soon as we, we basically fly one or two laps and keep the data of the um, not perfectly tracked trajectory and the control inputs and train the deep neural network on these data to basically um, compensate for this not modeled aerodynamic effects. And with that, we achieved that uh, significantly more precise tracking of the desired trajectory. So in the paper, you mentioned you did simulations and testing. Is there like specific things besides the tracking that this like improves compared to other mm -hmm. systems? So um, I think your question includes two parts. So the first one is how do we do simulation and or where is simulation required? And the second part includes um, where can this technique be used otherwise? So this real-time model predictive control that we use here um, can be leveraged in a broad class of different systems. So really for this work, um, the multi-rotor is just one toy example in the end. Um, in this work, we as well, for example, included another aerodynamic effect. So what we just showed there is we flew a quadrotor over a table. And um, if you fly with a quadrotor over a table, right, and especially if you fly over the table very closely, so we just really crossed it with just a few centimeters, there's something that's called the ground effect. The ground effect increases significantly the thrust of a propeller. So the closer you are to the ground, the higher is the thrust with a single propeller. So if you imagine now that you fly with a quadrotor over a table, what your quadrotor will do is just like fly over the table first with one propeller, and suddenly this propeller increases the thrust significantly. So we'll first of all be have some kind of a repulsive force that keeps you away from the table, but as well it will just lift your quadrotor and you will fly significantly higher than you expect it to do. And we as well learned this behavior with our neural network and included that in the control and could show that as well with this toy example, we can more precisely or significantly more precisely track the desired trajectory just close above the propeller. So we can learn the model of this aerodynamics above the table. Um, but again, this is just again a very domain specific example. So in principle, this approach can be used for any kind of a robot. Just imagine, for example, a racing car that uh, changes between like, for example, some asphalt on the street to some kind of an element on the racetrack where you see gravel. And these dynamics that are really hard to understand of between gravel and a tire and um, concrete and the, um, the, the wheel itself. And um, if you, for example, would just like drive with your race car a couple of rounds, you could just learn this behavior and then include a map where have you concrete on your track and where do you have gravel. And this will as well significantly increase the preciseness of your control for your race car. So this as well, this technique has can be used in a broad spectrum of applications. 
Shall we go back to your second question on simulation, or do you want to ask a question? No, no, go, go ahead. Okay, so um, we use simulations a lot. Why is this the case? I already said, as soon as you have a crash, it usually results in a significant delay of further research because the poorest PhD student or the poorest student has to first repair the drone. So what we try as much as we can is to simulate um, every behavior. So basically what we're having is a dedicated simulation environment where we fly our drones in, and that as well includes like the full control and perception pipeline. So we have, you might be familiar with uh, Unity, which is a game engine. And we basically developed uh, a model and a representation of the drone in this game engine. And we really control it there in a closed loop control. And basically only with a switch in the compiler, we can either compile our code for the real drone or for simulation. And before we really fly our drone outdoors and in real experiments, we really intensively test it first in a simulation because there's, if you write code, you always do mistakes. And that's something you have to accept. And you only reduce the chance of a crash, a crash if you extend, uh, test your system extensively in simulation first. So I think uh, what's, what's interesting about your career too is that um, you went, you know, you started in academia, continued in academia, and here you are in academia. Um, did you ever consider going to industry or, or do you ever consider perhaps at some point in your career uh, shifting over to industry? Um, as you just pointed out, I have a very academic heavy background. Um, but I could definitely imagine, for example, to do some kind of a sabbatical in a not too far future and to just dive into either a robotics company or more an aerospace domain company um, just to get as well a better feeling for what are the needs of industry, right? right? So because, um, of course, I'm a researcher, but at the same time, of course, I'm an educator. And as an educator, similar like for a researcher, but as an educator, you never stop learning in what, how can I improve my educational skills? What are actually the needs for the students? Because, of course, not all the students will be researchers afterwards. So we educate as well students to work in industry. And therefore, I definitely see lots of opportunities and reasons as well to, as well, at some point, work in industry. And so, what what kind of um, projects, perhaps, in ten years down the line, what what do you think will you be working on in in, in ten years, whether it's academia or, or industry? In ten years, that is as well a challenging question because the technology evolves so fast. Right. Um, let's phrase it differently. What would I like to see? in 10 years? What are the results that we, I hope, have in 10 years? So we talked about aerial physical interaction, right? Um, now I want you to imagine this robots that you know from Boston Dynamics, right? They have <laughs> this super cool robots, um, Atlas and Spot, the robot dog. And I think for everyone that I know, everyone is fascinated by these videos, right? It's uh, amazing to see what these robots can do. And of course, this uh, required a lot of research, but as well, it required lots of engineering. So really high skilled engineers to build these platforms. What I would like to see in the future that we see an improved agility of robots that are flying and are able to perform amazing um, maneuvers. For example, imagine a drone that has two manipulators and can touch things, do, does acrobatic maneuvers. Um, for example, a drone that is able to juggle, ro drone that is e easily able to grasp something, um, do acrobatic jumps with the arms. So really get into physical contact, understand this physical contact, do very acrobatic maneuvers, um, while touching the environment and doing that in a safe manner, that would be something that I would like to see in the future. You were mentioning before how you only deal with uh, s civil uses of, uh, of drones and, 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 uh, and your, your research area, but I'm, I'm just wondering if you ever consider or, or if the, pop ever, the, the thought ever pops in your head of people perhaps with different intentions using these, uh, this technology, this new technology, these innovations in a way that perhaps you hadn't intended to, in perhaps a malicious way. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question and a question that n we need to discuss. And therefore, I'm really happy that you're asking that question. Um, 
let's maybe state first, we as researchers, we have some responsibility for what we're doing, right? And we as community have to think about what can be done with our technology. Um, I have the feeling that we as researchers sometimes do not spend enough thoughts on that. Um, and probably we should do more. But for example, there are um, roboticists for peace. So there are certain organizations that actually really deal with this issue. Um, having said that, first of all, I'm both like a technology positive person, but as well, I consider myself as being optimistic about the development of societies. Having said that, I think we as society, we have to decide together how we regulate the use of technology. So for example, what kind of regulations do we put on autonomous weapons? Um, do we want to have that our armed forces have autonomous weapons? And this is something we as roboticists can't give an answer to, but we have to decide that as a society together. But we still, as roboticists, or as the developer of this kind of technology that is behind it, so we're not developing weapons or anything, but we have to keep in mind that we develop some kind of technology that can be used in a different way as we intended it. So what the role, I think, of us researchers in this field is, is we have to discuss or we have to be there as an external consultant to discuss the actual feasible things that are possible with society and discuss it with society. So we have to volunteer, because this is a technology that we developed as roboticists, to explain what is actually feasible with this technology and s at least steer this discussion and support this discussion. But again, this is a discussion that has to happen on a societal level. I think f for me, uh, another interesting question is too is a, um, especially because of you know your diverse background, not only in mechatronics, but also in me medical engineers, um, perhaps more of a hypothetical, but if you weren't working with uh, uh, autonomous aerial systems, wh what do you think you'd, you'd be doing? Um, is this a question if I would now stop working on... Or if, if you had never... Uh, oh, if, if, I, if I, I uh, you're taking a different I, So one thing that as well, but probably drove my curiosity um, towards uh, medical engineering, I could have as well imagined the beginning to become a medical doctor. So that would mm. be another career path that I would have chosen, so probably. Um, so when I was just ending high school, I was really wondering, should I do medical, in or so some kind of something related to robotics, or should I become a medical doctor? And then in the end, just my curiosity about robots was stronger than my interest in uh, being a medical doctor. Mm. So I decided for the career path of becoming a roboticist. And kind of to look a bit in the past, what is an achievement you're especially proud of? What is something mm -hmm. that you found in your research where you were yes. like, this is it? Yes. Um, it is hard to spot out just one thing, right? But let's say like, what is one of the things that um, when I was a PhD student and as well then towards like my first P uh, postdocs, what I, it's basically a bit of a spark from my side, is um, platforms that are fully actuated, aerial platforms that are fully actuated. So I think let's, let's talk a little bit about full actuation just for everybody to understand that. What does that mean for an aerial robot? So we talked about quadrotors, right? And quadrotors, we can control the position and the yaw orientation, right? And um, that means as well, if you want to fly from A to B, you have to change your orientation to fly in that direction. So you can't control independently the roll and pitch angles of your platform, but they are dependent on the trajectory that you want to track. Fully actuated platforms can independently control their position and their orientation. So what does that mean? So for example, you can hover, so stay in place, with any arbitrary orientation. And that is something that is very, very powerful. That is a very powerful tool. So first of all, of course, um, it's great if you can just hover within your orientation, right? Amazing. But as well, this is a prerequisite actually for aerial manipulation because suddenly you're able to generate an arbitrary wrench. So it means an arbitrary force and torque profile with your robot on the environment. So imagine just with an underactuated platform for like a quad rotor, if you want to do manipulation, it is very hard because within manipulation, what you have to do is control, for example, the end effector. And now imagine, right, that for example, there is a wind gust, right? And to compensate that wind gust with your quad rotor, you have to change the orientation, the attitude. So imagine now you have a manipulator 
and you change of the main platform the orientation. So what happens immediately is that your end effector is drifting far away off. And therefore, doing manipulation with an underactuated platform or with a standard quad rotor is very hard. But with a fully actuated platform, you can achieve or you can directly compensate that wind gust without changing the orientation. And that is very powerful and very helpful. And as well, during my PhD and my first postdoc, we developed basically the first two kind of classes of fully actuated platforms. And from there, lots of different platforms sprang off, and lots of people are now using fully actuated platforms in the domain of aero robotics. Well, that was very interesting. And um, I think just to, to wrap it up, uh, we were talking a little bit at the beginning about how you're uh, between uh, the, the seaside and, and the mountains. And so mm -hmm. I guess I think perhaps on a more personal touch, what, what do you like to do during the, mi during the summer, just to wind down, to, to relax? What, what's your go-to uh, summer um, holiday? In, in, while we were talking before the microphones were on, we talked about uh, like personal things, right? And uh, I just told you the year that I have three kids. Yeah. So what I'm doing now is very different to what I've been <laughs> doing in the past. Okay. <laughs> um, as well, let's say like in the last 10 years, I gained some weight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before, I was really a lot into climbing, right? I was climbing a lot, uh, therefore as well, really enjoyed mountains. Um, I did lots of via ferratas. I um, um, even sometimes did um, caving, so experienced caves and so on. That's really, really very, very enjoyable. So I can just tell you, um, if you ever have the chance to go underground and experience not a commercial cave, go for it. It's a very, very interesting experience. Um, but this changed now as well with having kids. So I still try to convince them that hiking is cool, <laughs> but that's hard, especially with a nine-year-old. Yeah. Um, but I sometimes succeed. So once I've convinced them, they usually enjoy it. But often I hear that in the end, I'll never do that again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something, some reality you have to face with. So um, if you now ask me again what I'm doing in my vacations, if I'm in the mountainside, I try as well to convince my kids to go for hikes and uh, spend nights at, in mountain cottages and so on. Um, and otherwise, I'm spending as well with my kids lots of time in pools, yeah. um, doing cool stuff with them. And that's as well very rewarding. So that's the other side. Uh, but they as well, of course, enjoy beaches as well. <laughs> well then, uh, Professor Rowe, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and thanks for listening to another podcast of On Air Rocket Science. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. I very much enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.